Hey, you on? Yeah, we are on. All right, well, we'll call the City of Port Orchard's Finance Committee to order on February 18th. So, Noah, uh, thank you, you seem to have the entire agenda here. <laughs> I did invite Jackie to participate and uh, help support uh, item number two, but let's get to number one first. Um, so the sales tax revenue, uh, treasurer's report, and then we'll talk preliminary tweeting financial financials. We're going to ask for there because we have still until May to look, so, so there will be some minor adjustments um, until now. Until May. Looking at the, the sales tax report um, for 2019, you can see that we collected $5,344,000, and we budgeted $5,060,000, uh, so ahead of what we budgeted for 2019 by about 5%. 0.62%, and then when we actually compare our 2019 collections to 2018 collections, we're about 5% ahead of where we were in 2018. So good growth uh, numbers for sales tax revenue collection in 2019. When we scroll down a little bit further and look at REIT, um, we've been talking all year about this, uh, so this should not be a surprise, um, but we budgeted $700,000 in REIT revenue. And we've received 1051000 so roughly 350000 more than we had budgeted for 2019. Uh, what's good about this is that we are on a biennial budget, so that represents about 75% of our <coughs> estimated budget for collections for the two years. Uh, so going into 2020, uh, we got a great head start to meet our budget and exceed it for the whole biennial. So what did you do wrong in April? We, we fell $13,000 short. Call on sales tax? Yeah. You did have a really good year, Noah, except for April 13,000. Mm. Sure. So don't repeat that next year. Well, budget is an art, not a science, so <laughs> we could adjust our April expectations. Uh, to be more aligned with real collections uh, and real real historical their federal taxes and didn't spend the money. Yeah. No, because isn't that a lag? It is a lag. So that's yeah. like January yeah. or February. Yeah. Or yeah. April, yeah, it's February. Um, so overall, real good news on REIT uh, when we compare year to 2018 to 2019. We're about 2.56% higher than 2018. And when we compare it to the budget, uh, roughly 33% higher than our budget. Uh, I think that's that sales tied to a wrong. You're a lot higher than 33% of budget. 351 over on a budget of 700. You're closer to 50%. Yeah. I think you're tying you it to right, actuals. Right. Like 33% is 351 of your actual of a million 51. Okay. Just if it's a public yeah. record, just the percentage. No, I can correct that. I think 351 is 33% of your 10 under the hand there. Why is this in that way? There you there go. go. Of the 1051, million 51. So it's yeah. just, it's just a calc, just a tied to the wrong cell. Door. Yeah. This is a PDF, so we can't fix it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Off of that. Yeah, good. Great. Um, but yeah, overall, great news for 2019. We did well in the sales tax revenue. Uh, the next document you should have in your packet is the uh, cash and investment report. So again, this just shows us the ending cash and investment balance and by fund for 2019. Yes. Just a question. It just um, you showed us these two different sales tax and re tax mm -hmm. collections. Our other main source of revenue is real estate taxes. Do we ever see how those come in? Uh, property taxes? Property, property taxes. taxes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can run those reports. I, I follow, traditionally, we follow sales tax right. and REIT, but we could add property tax. Right, because I would think as... They, just, they come in as projected. They don't fluctuate the way these two do, because these are. that's why we... Well, it's more here. of an issue of... Is it in line with what we have projected? Correct. Yeah. Because as, as we have yeah, more homes. increase mm -hmm. this year to the city. I just looked at mine. Yeah. So well, we go up 1%. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, new construction. Yeah. But when we, correct, when we mm -hmm. have new 
building, which we have a lot of in McCormick Woods, we would anticipate more re property taxes. But the assessor gives us that number, and what we budget is what, is what, what he gives get, us. Okay. What, what he gives us. I mean, it, it might it varies very slightly. You know, these we need to monitor because Correct. all of a sudden right. the sales right. tax starts coming in light. We may need to make a correction to expenditures. Correct. Well, yeah. property tax primarily comes in twice a year. Twice a year. Yes. This comes in all, yes. all year long, so you have an easier way to adjust for corrections. There's no reason when we get it in April and you know, October, no. we, get, we get it kind of in May. And but if you like, we can go more in depth of every kind of significant revenue source. And property taxes, um, they were on budget. They were slightly less than what we anticipated, uh, but nothing significant that yeah. caused concern. And I don't know that it's something we need monthly, but... Yeah. As we come towards the end of the year, it will be... Yeah. Um, when we do the monthly budget report, I'll, I'll make sure to put a comment in there on the property taxes. It's relevant to the conversation we're going to have tonight, though, is the year's performance. Mm -hmm. As Noah said, it slightly less, but we've got you know good good amounts and uh, the more than covered in these other sources. So when we look at the ending cash investment balances, uh, again, all our funds are very strong. I want to point this out because we talked about this finally got in front of it. Uh, 401 and 403 were the two combined water utility funds. Uh, that we made budget amendments for to transfer all those funds out. You'll see it has a zero fund balance now. Uh, so going forward, after 2020, we won't show those two funds anymore. Uh, for reporting purposes, we'll show it in 2020. Uh, again, because we're on a biennial budget, but going forward in 21 and 22, uh, you won't see those funds anymore. Uh, those proceeds were all deposited in the proper water utility as well as sewer utility. Um, the other thing to point out is the stabilization fund. Um, I did make uh, $400,000 of transfers from the general fund to the stabilization fund. And again, when we talked in the <coughs> biennial review, we added additional transfer authority. And I said I'd wait till the end of 2020 to make those transfers once we knew uh, and felt confident and comfortable with where the city was positioned. Um, so we should be caught up now. Once, <coughs> once we make the transfer in 2020, then yep. we will be on target. Yep. And we're, we're funded to, plan, to our budget plan. We just discussed that we would make an additional contribution that fully funds those right. reserves. Right. But state auditor, what they were requesting us to do. No, right. They've never added. It was our po our internal policies that are driving well, wait, us. I thought it was an audit, too, that our reserves were not high enough. No, it's our okay. internal policy. Okay. Okay. But we had such healthy fund balances, yeah. um, and we still do. Uh, you know, 5.3 million is fantastic in the general fund. Um, what can 107 be used for? That's that, our LTAC. That's LTAC. That's all LTAC. Okay. Yep. And the other report I'll bring next month. Uh, I don't have it this time, but uh, we'll bring back the obligation report. So we'll show REITs. I'm sure that is obligated because you're in good, healthy balance right now, but as we talked to someone that is obligated. And I'm hoping by next month's finance committee meeting we'll have some more closure on Tremont um, and close off a couple more invoices that are hanging out there. So hopefully we'll have that discussion too. 107 is more than just the, the uh, LTAC. Is it, where's the admission tax going? Uh, the admission tax goes into a subset in the general fund okay, that we track. Yeah. yeah. Should that name be looked at at some point? The title of 107 is not really misleading. It does suggest where the money's going. Yeah. <laughs> That's just my point. Yeah. yeah. Lodging tax, let's call right. it what it is. Yeah, call it what it is. Yeah. The easier to track. Yeah. Do you have an active outside committee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not enough hoteliers, though. Or at least hoteliers are going to participate. The other uh, fund I wanted to point out was Fund 500 into the Equipment Rental Revolving Fund. Mm -hmm. So that's our ENR fund. So as you remember, in the budget process, we knew we were going to be heavy on ENR in 2019, getting all that money into ER to get our uh, replacement value of the fleet plus the cash contribution to get it whole. 
Uh, so going forward in 2020, the replacement payments going to ER are going to be a lot smaller. And the reason I bring that up is because if you look at the fund balance in the general fund, $5.3 million, I've already made those transfers to the UNR as well as other funds. So as far as our... Wow. Yeah, that's what's really impressive when I start looking at these financials. We made some really significant contributions to stabilization. We made significant contributions to ERR. And we still have really healthy fund balances. Okay, well, when we even look at the grant total of where we started the year, 27.9, and we're at $34 million. What that stabilization, if it were fully funded, what would it be? It would be about $2 million. Okay. So we have about $700,000 of remaining authority. Okay. And we have budget, the budget calls for four hundred, dollars And then we talked about taking something beyond that four hundred dollars to get to that $2 million number. Yes, and, and then the council took action to fully budget the full appropriation. Mm -hmm. Again, with the pledge, I said I would not make that transfer until later in the year when we felt good about so it. So about 300000 on top of what we already budgeted in the, in the current biennium. So this is all positive, healthy, yeah, good that's stuff. That's great. Uh, <clears throat> have to see that from a cash perspective, that we actually have a lot of cash in each of our enterprise funds and in our general fund and in our street fund. Um, in our capital construction funds, so all good things. Still got a lot of projects going on. Still got a lot of projects, yeah. This didn't tell the whole story. Right, exactly. It's <laughs> obligated. Uh, that's the obligation yeah. for us. Yeah. Yeah. So the other report I put in here, again, trying to give you a high-level report on the 29 financials, is this <clears throat> budget report that we normally do as a part of our monthly uh, report. Talking with staff, they didn't want me to push out the monthly report yet until they tied those numbers tight, tighter. Uh, that's why I'm asking this and calling it preliminary. But what I want you to take away with uh, general fund revenues are about a million dollars higher than we budgeted, about 10%, that first row. Um, again, uh, sales tax was really strong, planning and permit fee revenue was really strong. Um, so, really good on the revenue front compared to what we budgeted. Um, and then on the expense side, you'll see each department is under their. Uh, anticipated budget by about uh, 14 to 20 percent. The one item there, six miscellaneous, that's for our transfer authority. So those are all expenses that I do not execute on. Stabilization, for example, uh, you see there's 854,000 of authority there. I'm going to push that to the next budget. Um, so that's why that's only at 50 percent of its budget because it's transfers. Uh, but you can see each department is well under their um, expenditure authority. Um, both in dollars and percentages. So this shows us a million dollars into the good. What? But that doesn't really tie out down here on the expense side. So where where are we in actuals to expenditure authority? So and this is where you have to be careful on the expense side because while we budgeted thirteen million dollars, okay. uh, we only spent ten. So That's we're six, we're. Nine. So there's really $2.5 million of budget authority, which I, which I would push to the 2020 budget year, because we're in a biennial budget, right? So the authority doesn't go away, we just move it to 2020. Now of that amount, about nine hundred or $850,000 of that is transfer authority. So those are expenditures I do anticipate will go forward in 2020 when we make the transfers. Um, I would have to kind of really go into each department's budget to see which Items for the savings. Do we expect and there to be public the works here? A number of things they just haven't gotten to yet, so that it's not. It's, it's, so that's a million and a half, but it's not probably really a million and a half. Right. And the biggest one, if you notice, is the law enforcement yeah. category at eight hundred twenty-seven thousand, which I should brought the detail on this is really the the savings on the jail bill. The jail bill is significantly, oh, really? significantly less than what we budgeted. So it's not. An officer. It's not a personnel issue. It's part of that because they haven't fully. Um, yeah, we're down, fully we're down one. We were down two. So that's part of the savings. Um, but the bigger portion, I think, four thousand was the savings on the jail bill. Outstanding. Yeah, I would say that our judge is doing a good job. Well, that's not our judge necessarily. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? No, deal? no, it's. Mm -hmm. Our That's our community service program, program and, 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 and him just being having a different flavor on how he sentences. 
But yeah, because if they end up in superior court, we don't pay that jail bill, even if they were arrested in the city and did the crime in the city. That's a superior court offense, and it doesn't, doesn't come out of our budget. It's when they're upstairs and they get 30 days for a suspended driver's license, right. like they did in the past, right. or didn't didn't appear, and they get third. No, well, we had a tough love judge before, and. Which Often referred to as a hanging judge. Hanging judge. <coughs> so I'm kind of skipping around here, and maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, so this was the work study that we'll have tonight. Executive summary. So we're going to report to the full council on the financial results, and I pretty much put everything I just talked about in the current expense fund in the narrative here. Um, so I hope that makes sense to you guys as you guys are reading that. Um, and I, I wanted to point these things out because what one thing we were tasked with coming away from the retreat was there was a, three items that we talked about, and the mayor said, hey, go finish up the 2019 financials and verify that we can go forward with these uh, additional tasks. And so uh, we talked about Laserfish, uh, acquiring services of community service consultant work, and then having an additional building inspector come on board uh, prior to John's retirement to have some overlap. Uh, in that transition. So when we looked at those three specific tasks and the results of 2019, um, again, I'll let you guys kind of read through the financials, um, but I'm confident A, we can fund all three and uh, do it com comfortably. Laserfish, again, is a software product that's going to improve our records management as well as workflow processes between all departments. It's a product that can be allocated to each of our funds, our enterprise funds, as well as general fund. And the cost of that is currently about $140,000, which is just the initial purchase and implementation. There we go forward, it's going to be about $15,000 a year. So like all software, it's the initial purchase, and thereafter um, we'll receive a nominal service fee every year. And we should see significant process improvements that will help us um, not hopefully have to grow staff. You know, that, that's, Last Do they year. offer an option? I mean, most software companies are go away from going away from the actual purchase of the software. It's just the subscription, right? Yeah, but yeah, the license they don't, they don't yeah. do that. Just, um, I don't know. Just I'm surprised that they don't because right. this is kind of an arcade yeah, way. Yeah, it's antiquated. <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, describing it correctly. Maybe it's actually written to be acquiring the licenses. Um, with it's the, the implementation is the expensive part. And Putting our staff yeah. into this process, okay. but generally the licensing fee or subscription fee, whatever on that right. basis, right. is way more than what you're quoting here for yeah. software. Yeah, and what's nice, so after we last met the retreat, uh, you know, got guidance from the mayor, we go prove it. You guys seem supportive. Uh, we met with uh, the laser fish representative, said we want to map this out because it's going to be a phasing. You know, just buy it and roll it out day one. And so our proposal would be to roll this out with the clerk's departments first, because uh, they would immediately <coughs> receive the most benefit from records management standpoint, and we would immediately start stopping the flow of paper, uh, and then roll out to the finance department if accounts payable. Uh, so we would be the first phase. Phase two would be the planning department and public works, with our final phase being courts and police. Um, so the budgetary impact may not be the full amount day one, because it's going to be over a number of months, maybe a year-long process as we kind of implement tests, get everyone caught up to speed. Um, but I thought it was a great value for what we're going to get. So when do you think it could start and when do you think it could be? Next next Tuesday we're hoping to bring you a contract. Okay. And then maybe by the end of 2020 getting close to having all three phases complete? That would be uh, the goal, yeah. I mean, part of it's staff time. Uh, I want to work with Brandy and see when she can get staff dedicated to learning the product and uh, get instituted. But even today, as we were moving boxes of payroll paper from the bottom floor to the top floor, uh, so this this gives you an idea of how much, it's not just my department, everybody I talked to today wanted to know when we were going paperless. And that was a, ten, a crew of, what, six guys from Public Works moving boxes, including the police department and myself, moving all our payroll boxes from downstairs to upstairs, and then they're going to do it again tomorrow and move police boxes from downstairs to upstairs. Everybody wants to know when we're going to pay We're going to stop doing this weird fourth and four attic shuffle. Uh, and I keep saying, really soon, really soon. <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, but Will this include the, the police department and DCD? You didn't mention them. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. They'll be in the, 
Public works and planning will be, DCD will be in the third phase or second phase, second phase, and then police and court will be in the last phase. But I think what we'll actually find is that everyone starts, we'll start seeing the benefits of the, at least the workflow side of it. Um, there's so many different things that come up that we talk about. Well, if we just had an e form for this and an electronic flow of the work and make it so much easier, like advanced travel. We talked about this last week when employees go into training and they have routing number for these employees in the training. You know, <laughs> all the paperwork. If it was in electronic format and they're just clicking through automated, it would save our time and their time. So I think there will be some little victories along the way that will get them excited when their turn comes to fully implement their side of it. So I'm going to talk about that because I want just to, again, focus on the financials that we're doing really well um, and, and ready to go forward with all these So we things. talk about the communications piece. Is that So Randy and Noah and I sat down and have worked out at an RFQ for a communications uh, consultant. And if, we, if, if you guys nod your heads, we'd like to bring that forward next week, too. I think it will cost us between twenty five and $30,000 for 2020, and it would be a trial and just, just to see how this works do we see benefit from it it will provide a consultant that will uh, update work with each one of the departments to update their web content uh, because we don't we lack the expertise uh, to do that and so now we've got a consultant that will help us what, what should this look we've got the we've got the nuts and bolts of it but we don't know how to you know to put it in the right format and and, and make it relevant the other side of that is pushing press releases, pushing out uh, Facebook information so that we can get out ahead of information. And if nothing else, we will learn how to do it ourselves, possibly, uh, and, and train some experts in-house. We could find out this is the best thing in the world and we want to build it into the 2020 budget. Um, but you know, I would like to at least try this, get us through 2020 with this, with a contract that has an option to review it and renew it if we like it and we see value in it. Um, it would be, I don't believe, we would have more cost in the initial part. We're, we're thinking five to ten hours, uh, was it a week or a month? A week, yeah. A week, five to ten hours a week. Um, we're thinking it's about $100 an hour. And there would be more to that 10 hours side of the scale in the first couple months. And then thereafter, once we have the content built and we're just, we have a, you know, the next Bay Street pedestrian path or the, the Bethel project or a phase of that, we're, you know, we're out in front of this in, in that communication piece. And it's probably only five hours a week, I would, I would think. And, and I just, I can't justify an employee at all for, for this. Um, but I think we could, there could be some value in having a consultant help us with this piece of it. So, I think John will agree with this. But if we put out a press release, it's to our benefit when it reaches the Kids Up Sun or reaches the Port Orchard Independent that they t take our press release and feel like they can print it as is rather than taking our press release and massaging it right. mm -hmm. to how they want it. I think there's value in us controlling the presentation of that. Mm -hmm. and we've talked about three elements. One is our, our external web content, the press releases you're talking about. And then we're also talking about, in our spare time, developing an intranet. And so we've got internal communication, too, that we can use some help with and what that content looks like. You know, it's from payroll stuff, but it's also just push communication uh, amongst the departments and within the city. And, and uh, so, I, we, we, so we three see a few different facets that, that we can use some help with. I certainly endorse the concept, and I'm going to be pleasantly surprised if we're going to be able to get all that done for the price you're estimating. <laughs> well, you're going to approve a contract for those dollar amounts, and if we don't get to all of it, then we'll reevaluate it at the end of the year. Okay, so when we got to that through half of this, and... Well, if you're going to do an RFQ or RFP, you're going to find out at least a consultant's estimate on some of these projects. And you 
you should know relatively early whether or not it's within the ballpark or not. I hope it is. Yeah. But, you know, I, I certainly endorse the, the need and what you're expecting or hoping to do, but I'm going to be surprised if you can yeah. do it for that little. <coughs> so the next item, and sorry, I skipped down to three. Um, I don't know why I did this, but I did. Uh, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, City Hall security. Uh, so uh, we put in the mid-biennial budget um, some upgrades to City Hall security. We're thinking doors, electronic door card readers, and cameras. Uh, we did the body work, went out, put out the RFP. Uh, results came back much, much more expensive than we had originally thought. You put 75 in the budget. The, pros, the cheapest proposal we got was 218. So we backed into. So that was cameras and card readers throughout the building, and the biggest expense is is wiring. And so we back this down to I think it's 18. And so there's this base software that we need that will be totally expandable to our future needs um, that we'll buy, and then then it's the access points, so exterior of the building, and then the ac entrance points to the different departments. We're not going to do whole bunch of offices, so it's 18 access points, uh, and then the software. And the, we still have challenges at Public Works with we have this and this software that we're going to buy will do our smart, so in a future phase and probably the next budget we would do Public Works and start with smart locks so that we can track who's going into lift stations, who's going into well campuses. So these cards will be these locks will read, the card will have a chip in it, they can lock it and, and, and it'll capture that and then next time they come to one of our buildings and tap, it, it does a data dump um, and it captures all of that data. So it's a really, uh, really sophisticated piece of software. It'll do all kinds of things I can't fathom that we would ever need, but who knows what our future holds. Stanley Door Company is the one that's actually doing, hard, there's actual hardware and wiring that, that happens. And we ended up at um, kind of reverse engineering this down. We're going to still be need $5,000 in additional uh, authority. Um, we have sufficient budget authority, but that contract, when it comes forward uh, next week, will be for 80000 instead of the 75000 that you guys budgeted. But I think it's we spent more than $10,000 just recently replacing the locks in the police department. So this is just this building. We're not doing just city community hall. Yep. development. Yes. And just yeah. certain access points. Yeah. So ex extra, not the double doors. So what will change with you guys is you'll come to the, if there's a side door here, there's one over on the Jackie's side, and uh, yours wouldn't work down the police department, but there is a door down here that they would work. So you can walk up, you're going to tap your card, and you know the door unlocks and, and you walk in. And then we'll still, the double doors were kind of expensive to do. We'll just manually unlock those, but there won't be a keyhole uh, anymore on, on the exterior of it. And then um, going up the stairs, uh, top of the stairs going to the council chambers would be another entry point, the back door to finance, the two front doors out here, and then all the, all of the and success points, and there's a number of them down in the police department. Uh, and uh, we can track who's gone where, uh, and you don't have authority to be in certain places and not others. So we just want to give an update that we originally thought 75 might get us cameras and doors, but then we learned not even close. Not even close. So we scaled it down to something we could bite off. Uh, within the intent of the budget, 75 to 80,000, uh, the contract I intend to bring forward next week. Um, we're picking back an office state, um, so following the right procurement procedures, um, and we'll require a $5,000 budget amendment when I bring one forward. So I just want to get you guys up to speed with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to, because I know it's important to you, Beck, the downtown sub-area plan, uh, again, that contract was awarded in December, I want to say, um, for $206,000. That was the one where we got the $50,000 grant. Again, one of these projects that once we put it out, the cost came in much higher. Um, at the time, I told the council, uh, we, can, we can afford to do this. Uh, we have the resources to do this, so if you guys want to do this, we can go forward. Um, I'm bringing it up again because I want to demonstrate that from the financials of 2019, we do have the resources to do this, both with new revenue, also within our existing budget authority. So one concept I floated with the mayor was um, we had significant savings on the jail bill, 400000 
it might be worth reallocating that $400,000 to the DCD department for this effort rather than doing a budget amendment. So just a budget adjustment, um, because again, I don't expect in 2020, if, if everything continues the way it was in 19 for 2020, we will continue to have significant savings in the jail bill. Uh, where normally I roll those dollars over, if I roll them over, we'll have a huge um, savings in the jail. Um, so I propose rather than amend the budget to increase it, uh, do a budget adjustment to move some money from one department to another, stay within our budget authority, and complete the project. <coughs> Another thing Noah and I discussed too is that we've been setting aside funds, members for that employee from that employee savings from the court into a fund to pay for their electronic records <coughs> system. Mm -hmm. They also just have turnover and they reduced their FTE count by another third. They said they didn't need another because they're still planning on they don't want to hire somebody that they don't need if they go if they can get to this electronic records management system. Right. So we talked about taking a chunk of money too to save for that software system that we know is going to be in the two fifty right. to three hundred thousand dollar range. Right. You know, the judge the court has saved us four hundred thousand dollars a year. Let's put fifty to hundred, make an extra payment towards that uh, big ticket item we know it's coming in the next couple of years. Which will ultimately save us more money. Yeah, because right. we don't have to budget for it. Right. Because we'll have it. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to the agenda. So uh, that kind of takes us through the preliminary 2019 financials and then retreat follow-up stuff. What, that, what then leads me into asset management planning. Um, and I have a little video to show you guys today to keep you enthralled in asset management. Popcorn? Um, come on. Slideshow. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, I, I was just up there. People are touching it. Um, so I want to bring asset management planning back. We talked briefly about this at the retreat. And again, I want to remind you, uh, the finance committee that we dipped our toe into asset management at the beginning of the biennium when you authorized the work for improving our GIS systems. Uh, we did a needs assessment. Uh, hire a consultant to come do a needs assessment. They came and gave us the roadmap and said, here, go forth, do these things uh, to improve your GIS system to get where you need to go. If you recall, even a step back further from that, we had budgeted uh, purchasing an asset management system in the prior biennial period, and we didn't get to it. And part of it was the language between departments, the communication. Um, what I've found, learning more about asset management, we might be saying the same words, but they mean different things to different people. And so we were having conversations going completely different directions. And that's when I got the team together and said, well, what are you really talking about? And that's when I learned that, you know, Darren and his team was focused on GIS. And I was hearing asset management software over here and planning over here. And so we were just talking different things. We got together. We said, great, let's do the GIS piece first. Uh, the needs assessment um, came in and said that this was the first step into asset management. We've accomplished that work. We're in the phase now of scanning those as-built documents to get them into an electronic format. Once our electronic format, laser fish is going to come and scoop that up and make it all searchable text. So it's a great um, uh, partnership there that just happened to work out. Um, but we've essentially completed that project in my mind because we got it upgraded and we got the third phase of the project was scanning documents and get as many into an electronic format as we can. Um, the next phase of that project is really developing a plan. So when I talk to the public works, I go, well, what's your plan? Because uh, Jackie will say, hey, I need the software, I need the software. And I go, well, what's the plan? Who's going to operate the software? How are the crews going to put the data into the software? Who, who are the people? Who are the things? Um, and so that takes us back to where I think me and Jackie have finally started to talk the same language, that step two is really developing an asset management plan um, before we go get the software. And I'll share some experiences we've learned from other entities who did not do that and are now struggling to use their software and are now regrouping and go back and actually developing a plan. So we just wanted to talk um, real basics about what asset management is um, and why we think it's important. So what is asset management, what are the benefits, who's involved in asset management, and then uh, bullet number three is how do we continue to build on our asset management program, which um, we've come to start with GIS. We, we know this is important, but there's also the component of it is that 
we, that our state agencies are, are going to require this of us. So uh, sooner versus later, we have to do this. Otherwise, we're not going to be eligible for funding. That's correct. Uh, so we have a couple definitions here. Um, the coordinated activity of an organization to realize the value of assets. The one definition I actually like that I put in the, uh, the executive summary, if you read that over, is asset management is a strategy used to meet a required level of service in the most cost-effective manner through management of our assets for present and future customers. So it's really about managing our assets as a team and putting uh, the lowest cost value into what we want. Um, again, another definition I'm not going to focus on other than you can see from the picture that it involves all our departments, involves the whole city, and it involves all our assets, engineering management, operations, maintenance, capital. Um, it's all involved. So what are the benefits of managing your assets? Well, we can make informed data-driven decisions. Uh, we can align our business processes with our goals and objectives. Two of those things you, you recognize right now we haven't done. We manage stuff, but we don't track the data. We're not making data-driven decisions yet. This is what the plan will help us accomplish. Um, aligning our business processes is another one. How are we utilizing our water, sewer, and storm enterprises, and how are we aligning our capital improvement plans with our long-term operation maintenance goals? Um, critical assets are identified and prioritized. Now, shocking, we still find assets we didn't know we had, right? Meters in the ground, pipes over here. We are still learning about our own inventory in our asset system. Uh, we want to focus on transparent infrastructure replacement and optimizing our preventive maintenance scheduling. And lastly, as the mayor was pointing to, there are financial advantages and uh, also disincentives that if you don't have an asset management program in place, then we're going to come back some dates coming up here. So who's involved? Well, city council and the mayor, of course, because you guys are setting policy objectives for us. What level of service do you expect from your water system and your sewer system? Um, how are you setting your rates? Uh, to fund those operations. What are we doing on the capital side and improving them? Uh, you have your directors and management team involved. How are we communicating to each other about what assets we're going to maintain and at what level of service we're going to maintain them? And we have our citizens and customers because they're impacted by our assets and how frequently we need to maintain those or if they <coughs> fail and break down. You know, that's on us and our citizens. So where we think we need to go is, uh, and this is kind of the ask is, we're looking towards, we can't do this work in-house. It's really me and Jackie that have been trying to push this boulder of asset management along and talking with other entities and seeing where they're having successes. They have contracted us out, this work out for some consultants to come in and help us, again, develop the plan, the roadmap, and get the, the proper stakeholders involved so you are making the right decisions. Um, they even take it a step further to have that consultant on board for when they go out and procure the software. So then all the softwares are tailored to what a specific entity wants and needs to meet their goals and objectives for level of service. Uh, so here's the phases that uh, Jack and I have talked about and we've looked at what other entities have built into this consulting work. Um, defining our assets, actually putting together a document. I know that's crazy, but putting together a written document that defines our goals, objectives, our policies, and what is our level of service and expectations that the council uh, would measure us to. Um, we would come in to actually create this strategic asset management plan, um, and we would propose focusing on our enterprise funds first, because A, they're very healthy, they can afford this consultant work, and it makes the most sense right now. At some point later, you might want to roll in some other general fund activities, maybe facilities, maybe um, roads. Um, counties will do that. They'll do a much broader look at facilities and roads, and and there's two operations, but right now we want to just kind of get going on it, baby steps, you heard me say that a lot. Looking at the water, sewer, and storm enterprises um, makes a lot of sense to start developing plans for each of those specific enterprises. So why now? Why am I bringing this to you now? Um, Jackie and I have been working on this for six to eight months and probably been going back longer we've having conversations on this topic. There's a couple of driving dates, uh, June 1st, 2020, where Department of Ecology is going to essentially start requiring all entities uh, receiving state funding have an asset management program in place. Uh, Drinking Water State Revolving Fund is also soon going to require that in order to get a loan or a grant, <coughs> you have to have an asset management program in place. Um, WUFA stands for what again? Water Infrastructure Financing Innovation Act. <laughs> 
Uh, and they are also going to soon require them. That's coming down from the federal level, um, which makes a lot of sense because, again, if you think about the amount of money we're spending on our assets, $50 million in our infrastructure between water, uh, water pump stations, wells, sewer lift stations, um, all the main lines, we have $50 million of capital we just put in the ground, but now we're not creating a strategy to maintain them over time and get the best life cycle cost out of them. Um, so, folks, on all our new assets, right? Um, we got $25 million worth of new assets coming on our books over the next couple of years. Um, everything that we're building, working really hard to fund, we should have a plan on how to maintain those going forward. The uh, city could lose out on funding opportunities. Uh, that's something that Jack and I keep talking about as these capital projects are expensive and we will need to look to borrow. And if we don't have a plan in place, at least a plan, uh, that's not going to bode well for our, our scoring in these grant applications. Um, not having a plan and program in place is just a risk to safety and citizens. I think that makes sense. And then anytime we delay uh, kind of taking the next step, it's just, as you guys know, these things take years to kind of work its way through a whole program. GIS we, we thought would take a year and it's taken 18 months and that was the baby piece of the whole program. Um, so why now? Because uh, I want to get this consultant on board in order to help us develop the roadmap and time for our 21-22 biennial budget period. Start kind of looking that far forward. Um, and that's why I bring it to you guys because you guys are always looking, you know, three to six years in advance. And this is, again, another body of work that's going to take time and then we'll have a roadmap and some answers of what needs to occur over the next couple of years. Uh, but these looming dates are coming. So with that, um, that's the big ask. I'm trying to get direction from uh, the finance committee as well as the full council tonight. We're going to talk and uh, go through the same speech. Um, and hopefully you guys will give us the direction to, yes, this makes a lot of sense. I've put two examples up here. Thurston County, I would say, was the bad example. They are the county that went out and bought the software but did not have a plan, did not communicate amongst its departments on how to execute their asset management program, or nor did they talk to the uh, commissioners about what the goals are in the county, what level of service do they expect. And so they spent a good two years with the software, not implementing anything. They've since gone back, to hired a consultant to develop a plan and program for them so they get the whole, uh, all the stakeholders on board with what they're trying to accomplish. City so of Burlington, on the hand, I would say was a good example because they just got done doing this uh, strategic planning with a consultant, and now they are prepared to go forward and acquire the software. Um, they've also committed now, this is kind of interesting, they've committed to a part-time asset manager. So in their city, they decided that it was so valuable and important that they actually needed to have a staff position at part-time. Um, and that was a result of all the work that went into the planning effort and the developing a program and what that looks like. Um, we're not proposing that, we're just proposing let's get a babysitter going here and develop a plan. And that person is going to be shared by all the departments. Correct. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So two examples. I, I think Jackie might have more. Oh, yeah. There are lots of examples where um, things become so fragmented and um, a department will go out and purchase software because they got talked into it by a consultant or whatever and then Nobody, other departments are, will not get on board with it, and they have trouble implementing, and it becomes so cumbersome that just like Thurston County, they basically throw it out and start over again. Um, one of the things that is so important about um, this next step in having a plan is I've been involved in other utilities where there were um, computerized maintenance management systems, which is kind of now, as I understand it, old school. The new thing is enterprise asset management systems, which is basically the next step. So my not being familiar with that, I would really like to have a consultant on board to help us through that. Right now, Tony and I have no way of evaluating the assets that are in the ground. Any of our water and sewer and storm facilities, we have no way of evaluating them because we don't have any place to analyze the information. So we're basically reactionary rather than proactive and being able to say, oh, this pump needs to be lubed every six months and, and, and establish those those um, maintenance schedules. So. And as Jackie and I were talking, we felt like that's where the value of the consultant really comes in, a expertise. But to give us the options for level of service, for example, what does this level of service mean to you versus this? What do you guys want to do? Um, coming from us, it's, it's going to take us time to figure out what that yeah. means. But so this would, this would basically, what I'm hearing, 
is that it would basically help us manage the assets that we have currently, the enterprise funds assets we have currently. And assets that are added as they're and, added. And, and they're added. But it doesn't address the needs of the assets we need to add. No, I would say I would say they're all going to be connected. Okay, so, so that, that's my question. I, I, I want yeah. to see a plan. Yeah. I know we've got our capital improvement plan mm -hmm. and all of that, but when I hear um, or go through what we just did with the McCormick Woods water, right. and then we just had another water issue, I want to know what is the, the, the true long-term needs that the city has for getting our water, for our sewer. Uh, well, uh, okay, um, maybe I can address that. Maybe because I'm not on utilities, I don't have an in-depth on that. Well, this an asset management plan, I always like to think of it as a three-legged stool. Okay, One leg is the GIS, one leg is your um, documents management, and the other leg is this computerized maintenance management system, or now the upgraded level of that is enterprise asset management system. What that is, is that's where your work orders, inventory are tracked, and all of the maintenance of items that have happened Ex and yeah. that have happened and so it's a budget tool so that I can say here's what we did the last two years here's what I'm going to need the next two years it's also a maintenance management tool that tells me it just pops out work <coughs> to certain people and say hey you need to go lube those pumps this week or you need to you know whatever and um, the other thing that it does is helps to track I mean they, they're so sophisticated now that they'll track water rights they track you know, longevity are the depth and, and uh, static levels of water in wells. I mean, just basically anything that you want to have programmed into it. And they're so complex now, that's why I think that we need a consultant not only to help us with the plan of how to implement, but which one of the myriad of software should would be best for us. To address Beck's question, we've hired BHC, which we're having as our new water system plan, and um, we took a huge step forward. We're having, just like every consultant in the world right now, we're having some challenges with them right now. We're learning a lot about our water system. Um, some of it are hard. Some of them are hard lessons. Um, I don't think we're done. Well, hopefully, we're not. We're done with big surprises. Uh, the challenge, our challenge is, we're not keeping up with demand right now, and it's, things are happening fast. I think that we're not unique in that, uh, and uh, you know we're we're probably going to be. Well, I know we are. We're we're working uh, with a consultant right now. A matter of fact, Katie, Katie Isaac said again, and we'll be. We've got some challenges too, and funding challenges, and we're going to be bringing forward uh, information and probably implementing some uh, connection fee. You know the in, the. Capital CFCs, 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 capital facility charges, changes. I think we're going to have to, and uh, uh, that's coming. But this is really a tool, I think, to manage what we have. And the, there is, right. a, there, there's, there is. A, there's a lot of work we're doing on that other piece so we, because God knows I don't want another moratorium either. I mean, that's not where we want to be. But from the transit side of the world. There's two different things. What you're suggesting is more of a uh, predicting the need, and that's separate from this. this. This is more maintaining what we have, uh, predicting when things need to be replaced, things of that nature. I get, I get uh, that. That's good. Yeah. yeah. There's probably some crossover. <coughs> there. Yeah. If you're going to build is. a new water tower, and you might know. What the connection capacities are in the future, you know, I mean, some of some of that could well, be built in to help provide the data to better analyze. The yeah. Right. Yes. But you know, they tell you our need to build a new water tower. That's kind of a separate thing. Correct. But yeah. it should I give have, us more data. Yeah. So. I have concerns sitting on KRCC, um, knowing that we're going to be <coughs> expected to double our population in 20 years or 25 years, whatever it is, right, right, right. you know, are they all going to be able to flush their toilets? Yeah. You know, are they all going to be able to turn on their water faucets? It's more in our comp plans. And our, right. Yeah. But we have to we have to get our heads around that. And I'm supportive of this. I don't think you put a price tag on this. Yeah, that was my next question, too. For, for the first body of work. Right. 
I'm going to put a big number out there because I like to give you guys big numbers and then come back with something smaller later. <laughs> You're not doing that. You're giving us. Mark, I, I, that, Mark Darcy does the other. <laughs> he does the other, and I think that's a terrible approach. Um, I think 100000 is what this plan, this consulting plan effort would cost. And then we would have additional costs for the software, but we'd size the software to what this city actually needs. Um, I don't see this much different than the Cytel uh, value work that we did four years ago where we knew we had all kinds of computer infrastructure needs, but we didn't have anybody in-house that knew the answers. And, and yeah. we got to, I mean, we'll go spend that much on a piece of software, and if we don't buy the right piece of software and know how to use it and execute it, we've wasted the money. So I think that this is a logical first step so that we, as Noah said, buy the right software to fit our needs and then have a plan. The plan is the important part to and implement it to make sure we use it effectively. You know, this is this is something that we've been using in the transit world for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Federal Transit Administration requires this now. It's a big thing. With yeah. The, the grant right. but you know, I'm I'm all for this. Once again, maybe my experience with consultants is a whole <laughs> different world than your experience with consultants, but a hundred thousand. If you were able to get this done for 100000 give me the name. <laughs> I want to put them on my list. Well, you know, when you put the RFP out, then you know. But, uh, yeah. Um, we're, gonna, we're spitballing right now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're no, we're going to do an RF, RFP and, yeah. and, and bring back a contract. And the, the, yep. the goal is a good one. I think yeah. you guys need to do it. I think we've reached the point where we can't do it on the back of a napkin anymore. You need something that really is... Yeah, I, I think that's what we've learned over the last yeah. couple of years, and thankfully Jack is part of the team to help us now move this forward in the right direction. Well, you know, a, long, a while back I had concerns because most of our water system was in the head of a couple people that had been here for 30 years, and they walked right. out the door. And we're still trying to figure out where all the vital valves are. So. Yes, and we're still trying to... Assess our inventory. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so I do. I, I do want to show this because I want to give you guys feedback. Because again, we intend on doing this whole, same presentation for the full council tonight yeah. uh, to get them up to see what our asking is. And I thought this video, at least when I saw it, um, was useful for me to, to understand asset management. Um, it's kind of long. It's an eight-minute eight video. Um, but I like that. So I want to get your feedback if you like do. Disney, I was just there. Representing a huge range of organized organizations and industries. Our question was this. What does it feel like to be on the asset management journey? The resulting picture is designed to be used as a large poster to stimulate conversation in your business about where you are on the journey. Hard copies are available from the IAM website. Before they start the journey, most organizations find themselves making asset-related decisions reactively and in isolation. Cost, risk, and performance all need to be factored in, but each factor has its own team, its own specialism, and its own language, and no one seems to be able to translate between them. Here's a typical organization. The leadership team who make the strategic decisions at the top are far removed from the reality of the assets at the bottom. There's a clearly understood pecking order from finance and planning down through projects and engineering to operations and maintenance at the bottom. Each bubble represents an individual tribe with its own leaders, language, customs, rituals, assumptions. Decisions are taken based on the limited information that's available locally and therefore tend to be very reactive. Here's a typical example. Something happens to an asset that causes a major disruption. This could be anything, a material failure, an environmental incident, a technical fault. Amidst the panic, there's excitement because those first on the scene feel pride in their ability to handle the crisis, and heroic behavior is something the culture rewards. In the immediate aftermath, the risk tribe homes in on the incident and tries to eliminate the possibility of it happening elsewhere. Because the causes are unknown, they make sweeping decisions, which the engineering trial across the way sees as an overreaction. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any way of translating the engineer's experience and intuitions into a risk model that the risk people will understand. The maintenance people are upset because they've been warning about this for years. Now customers start leaving as service declines, with direct financial consequences. 
As cash dries up, finance start delaying capital investment, which leads indirectly to further incidents. And round we go again. Notice some of the things going on here. Everyone's making good decisions based on their own limited understanding of the world. These are good people. They have certificates, standards, and processes. Unfortunately, they're contributing to a system that, as a whole, is making terrible decisions because they're not made from the perspective of the overall system. Add to this a multitude of external contractors, suppliers, and outsourcers, and the idea of making joined up whole system decisions can seem hopeless. So how do organizations move on from here? The energy for change comes from two sources, top-down and bottom-up. Starting with the bottom-up energy, many businesses already have a groundswell of pioneers trying to break down the barriers. These people know the business needs collective decision-making and are building networks across boundaries to try and make this happen. As for the top-down, sometimes the impetus is personal as senior leaders take responsibility for change. Other times, it's external pressures from owners, regulators, and the like. This often leads to a drive for certification. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for businesses to push for PAS 55 or ISO 55000 status, put the certificate on the wall, then promptly revert to their old ways of doing things. We need more than this. ISO 55000 certification is in many ways the start rather than the end of the journey. The standard gives a framework for reconnecting the assets and the organizational objectives in business decision making. The biggest difference now is that at least people are sitting collectively around the table to make decisions. What this reveals though is just how much is missing before these decisions will start looking optimal. The clouds represent some of the things that are getting in the way. Looking upwards to the strategic objectives, these are often unclear, expressed in contradictory language, and point to competing agendas. <coughs> Looking down towards the assets, without the historical data, we end up relying on proxies and assumptions. Many of the processes that give us the information are not yet defined or embedded. With such an imperfect system, the big danger is cynicism, that the organization as a whole isn't going to change. This can lead back into blame games. For example, the business may have invested in a decision support tool that no one really understands. Local maintenance staff then feel aggrieved that their professional judgment is being ignored. At the same time, an increase in awareness of asset management concepts and techniques can lead to a real sense of empowerment. The danger is that unless the culture changes as well, empowerment just fuels the creation of new silos. Although this stage may be imperfect, just having a system that brings people together to make decisions will inevitably yield quick wins, providing impetus for further investment in transformation activities. Unfortunately, these activities can't all happen at once. So there need to be winners and losers, as interventions are prioritized according to what will yield the greatest benefits for the whole. But in a way, this is the shape of things to come. Until individual teams are prepared to accept that the right decision for the overall business may be the wrong decision for them locally, optimal asset management decisions will not be possible. So, looking forward, what is an optimal asset management decision? We can state in general terms that it's the decision that maximizes the long-term value of assets by aligning them to the objectives and purpose of the business. But what that looks like will vary markedly from business to business and industry to industry. That said, there are a number of factors that all outstanding asset management organizations have in common. Firstly, they have leaders who walk the talk. They don't just tell people to collaborate, they model what collaboration looks like. Secondly, these organizations embed asset management as a philosophy of continuous improvement rather than seeing it as a one-time transformation program. It's an ongoing journey, not a destination. Thirdly, it's apparent that everyone is playing their part, whatever their role or seniority. The formal policies and management system provide a framework for integrated decision-making, but these organizations are very fluid in how insights and information flow from team to team. 
An example of this is how the organization treats its data. Good decisions rely on good information. With a shared understanding of the decisions they need to make, teams can reach a consensus about the information they need to make those decisions, and the best way to get hold of and maintain it collaboratively, which may or may not involve IT systems. In an asset management culture, information is treated as an asset and cared for in its own right, for the good of the entire organization, as well as for future generations. But perhaps the most striking difference in an organization with a culture of asset management is what it feels like to be part of. Because the organization is always learning and improving, risks become more contained and incidents become far less frequent. This creates space to think more expansively about the possibilities for greater innovation, about the longer term future, about what could be learned from other industries, or even about the organization's very reasons for existing. This is the journey our members have described to us. So where are you? What elements of the picture seem most familiar to you? Who do you need to talk to to move things forward in your business? It's about having the right conversations. This picture was designed as a tool for starting discussion. So why not order a copy and see where those conversations take you? Do you value in showing that tonight? I'm sorry, you'll have to sit through it again. Yes, no. I mean, if, if the person doesn't know much about it, I suppose there's a benefit to it. Mm -hmm. Provide mm -hmm. everyone the link mm -hmm. just to yeah, support actually, it. I mean, I think your presentation was great. Yeah. I thought, right, I thought the way Noah articulated it would meet our needs, okay. and they can have this link if they want. Oh, so we'll email it like that. Okay. Okay. All right, we've got a few things left. Dropping down to personnel, is that what we're? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, uh, do you have? Have you and Debbie had a chance? Does Debbie have that? Uh, those job descriptions? Yeah, we just got the job description, so we're reviewing that. So, if you guys recall, um, we had this conversation about two months ago. Uh, Ian is currently a civil engineer one. He was sitting for the exam to uh, get uh, PE certified, and so we brought this issue to you guys. Um, so that in our current org structure, we don't have a way to promote somebody up. Um, if they are re reaching certain certifications and milestones, that they could actually produce more for the city. Um, so he passed his exam. So we put it on Mark and, and Ian to work on those job descriptions. So we're going to create a engineer one, engineer two, Chris is the three, assistant city engineer, and then Mark, of course, is the director. So we're going to bring those, and then our plan is, is then to as soon as that's approved to promote Ian to that level. Uh, he's been an exceptional employee. So. Um, the, I talk, touched on the clerk, the court mm -hmm. clerk. Um, they had a full-time position. They're posting 28 hours. Um, <clears throat> if there weren't vacations and people got, didn't get sick, they probably wouldn't need those 28 hours, but they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular on Mondays and Tuesdays, they're quite busy up there. And then the last piece for the court, um, we had a court security officer. Uh, she left us, uh, and uh, we're reevaluating that, and we're likely going to contract with uh, Kitsap County as uh, court security officers up there, and they're likely going to uh, provide that service to us. And so we'll contract out for security um, on the days we have court and not have an employee that's, you know, we're paying benefits and everything to. I found it interesting at our economic development meeting on mon on a Monday upstairs. Yeah. You had to go through that. You, you, you had to go that again. Come up, come up, you can come up back. Well, I, I did, but when I left, I'm going, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we have a metal detector now, which is great for the security up there. And uh, so we're going to make, now the, the chief thinks that he's now uh, gained an FTE because we can't, you know, then we're going to transfer that budget to the court, and we had to, you know, hopefully we've educated them enough that, you know, we're just transferring that budget authority to the court, they're going to manage their own security, um, but those dogs are either a contract, and we're going to reduce the FTE count by, by one, so we can get everything. And then, I just got some bad news today, and I'll share it with the full council tonight. Uh, when we opened up the wall in the library, it's far worse than we imagined. 
Um, and uh, there's not just one corner. They, uh, they've gone up in the attic and looked. It's all four corners of the building. There's four scuppers. They're all leaking. Um, the one corner is going to cost us at least $30,000 to fix, and you can probably multiply that times more. Um, it's, 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 it's structural. Um, the rot, the rot. So at what point do we offer, have to ask ourselves the question, why would we fix that? What's the value of that building? I wish we, wish we had an alternative, because I think it would cost us more than $150,000 to uh, TI and a, a build, another building, or find, if we could find another building to move the library. What's our contract with the library? Um, we provide them a facility. Yeah. And, and, In uh, perpetuity? Current, yeah, that's our current agreement. Um, I, I had the conversation I had with Jill Jean two weeks ago about this community center and their commitment to the community center. We will modify it. If, if, we, if we pull off this community center and we go through a process uh, to get a new library. Are community doing that? No. No. Others do it. The other cities do it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This but is the first time I've heard where it's in perpetuity, but yes. I mean, well, we have an, we have an eye out. a combination, but cities do. But Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. But if we if we get them into the new community center, we're out of the library facilities. That that's that's the long term goal with just that. As far as we just this conversation we just had about asset management, yeah. where we keep ripping, we should identify what a number is that that yeah. it's. My other question is: Has this leakage caused any? What else you gonna find when you open up the other four corners? How old's that building? It's the old post office. It's really old. That's what I'm saying. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. So at what point does it need, need to tear it down to start over? It's really old, but it's old. <laughs> yeah, I remember when it wasn't there. <laughs> okay. I can't. So I, yeah, so I it's really old to be referred to as old. <laughs> perspective. It's, yeah. There's, What's the use of life? It, it's, it's, it's expired, but I don't have any place to put the library. That's, that's the problem. And I, I'm... I just what I just ran upstairs because I just learned this before this meeting is I'm like, we're going to talk to our insurance company. You know, the roof leaked. We didn't know it. Um, we, you know, we're going to explore an insurance claim because we're looking. I, Mark's saying 120. Mark never gives me low numbers. Well, what else are you going to find once you get in there, right? Yeah. It's just it's just and 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 and. Yes. On a building of that age. Yes. I, and That's where I hate to get in the middle of it. Like, it oh. Yeah. I wish well, I had an alternative. The original building is old, but then we this is remodeled the, it. Yeah, this uh, is the addition on the back, mm -hmm. which is stick framed, and that's what the problem is: is that it leaked and the wood's rotten. Wasn't it remodeled when Sue Whitford was in charge of the library yeah, facilities? We, we, we did it. We, sure. we um, charge. Or is this, or, or was that a second one? Did they the, just do the? Um, we had a brand new roof on the flat part that leaked, and. When I, gosh, John, was that 10 years ago when we put the pitched roof on the front part of the building? We thought we didn't want to invest in, in the pitched roof on the whole building because we knew that we were going to um, build a new library someday, and we didn't think it would be a good investment. I bet there were two different. Yeah, and that's, now that's the, the roof that's failed and that, so it's probably 120 plus a roof. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing 150 thousand dollars at this point. Um, so I just get a pair of bad news. I agree with Sean. It's boring good money after bad, but there's no option. I don't. I don't have space in City Hall. Sounds like the marquee, doesn't it? Yeah, I think very similar. So well. Uh, yeah, I, and again, I don't know what the ITs look like. I mean, we've got empty buildings in Fort Orchard. And again, I don't know what ITs are, but we should at least investigate it a little bit. Like my race. Mm -hmm. Can we just tear down? Okay. We've got no stick on there. Okay. Well, we asked them to. I'm glad they did that. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, we're going to explore an insurance claim. Um, but we can't. I mean, now we've got the library. How many square feet to library? Ten thousand, less than ten thousand. They need ten thousand. They're under that. It's you know eight or nine, I think. Are there any of those big storefronts up at the South Kitsap Mall? Yeah, I think 
There's only one left, but they open up the recent grocery store. I don't know. Oh, right. Do There's one on the end. Yeah. I think we should just ask, just ask ourselves the questions. Right. Right. Boy, that yeah, could right. turn no, into exactly. a, I could turn into a half a million dollar deal just like that. Yeah, it's Do you plan on taking out the tenants? Can it send us aware? Of that building? Uh, not at this point. We've got it encapsulated in the back of the building. Just um, curious. <laughs> we happen to be one of them. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about you. Thanks. <laughs> I was concerned about the children in the middle because it's the children's section of the library where the <clears throat> problem is. And we've got, they're, they're out of there and we've got it tented. That other word I used, have, have you ran into that? You have. Bad. And that's huge. You love it. Let's say this community center gets built in the next five years, and now, now we're saying it yeah, said ten years ago, but you know, would that building become a teardown, most likely? I believe it is. Right. So, I mean, I would rather invest TI work into a building that's going to stay, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. than throw two or three hundred into a building that we're going to tear down in five years. It won't be a comfortable conversation to have with KRL if we move them somewhere else other than our waterfront, and I don't I don't have a well, space for it. And that's fine, but we're going to have to, I think we have to have those conversations. I mean, it's just, that's taxpayer money. It's just, you know, and if it doesn't make I, sense, it doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, the other thing that I You're dealing with a life safety to, issue right now, too. Right, 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 right. And long term, and I don't think there's anything that says that, that the library has to be in the water. No, right. We're, we're looking at it from a standpoint of emergency repairs, and I don't, I don't know that I have time to investigate. Unless you shut it. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm not advocating that we shut down our library. They get 12,000 visitors a month. Right, unless there's truly a life safety issue going on. Yeah. And that's an emergency. Yeah. So. Right. That's right. We've got one corner of it opened up, and the, the contractor's there believing it's about thirty thousand dollars. Mark there were him and Han over there. I said, and it's it's as bad as it could be on that corner. I said, well let's assume every corner is just as bad. That's how I came to the number uh, that we did. And yeah, but maybe, two of the two of the four corners isn't stick burn. It's to the sides. It is. Everywhere these is it the, the addition, the four corners of the addition? Yeah, and, and, and it's the side. And what's the square footage of the, of those four corners? Like, roughly. Have you four been thousand square feet. It's yeah, it's where the kids 4, are. Yeah, it's about half of it. Yeah. And I, I, it's safe to assume that the source is the roof and the scuppers, so we've got to repair. can't fix the, the you know, what, what it caused without fixing the source, sure. you know, so we're going to put ten thousand dollars in a roof, you know, and re roof in that half of the building. So the other half it has got the pitch metal roof that we replaced ten years ago and it's new. So it's the other half of the building that we didn't want to didn't see see the see a need to address. more than ten grand. <laughs> Everybody here. Yeah, I need to meet your friends. You guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I would put them on my mid list. <laughs> so, we're gonna, All right, we're is there gonna... any other good news before we turn the recorder no, off? No, so, a lot of bad news. All right, anything? I guess we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.